You are listening to Wordslinger Podcast, episode 129, Ignoring the Arbiter of Good with Russell Blake. This episode of the Wordslinger Podcast is brought to you by draft to digital Convert your manuscript, distribute it online, and get support the whole way at draft to digitalcom It's the Wordslinger Podcast, where story matters. Build your brand, write your book, redefine who you are. It's all about the story here. What's yours? Now, here's the guy who invented pants optional, Kevin Tomlinson, the word slinger. Word slinger. Hey, everybody, this is Kevin Tomlinson, the word slinger, uh, coming at you at a slightly reduced volume than normal. <laughs> I really don't understand why. Um, I'm using my uh, sort of my travel kit. Uh, which is, you know, the same general setup I, I use, but it's a uh, smaller and more portable uh, recording device. And uh, for some reason, I this is the best I can squeeze out of it right now. So I apologize. <laughs> and I hope you're able to hear me. Um, so I've got a great interview uh, lined up today. Before I get into that, I, I'm currently, I'm, I just have to tell you, I, so I'm in Salt Lake City right now, Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm uh, I'm staying with uh, some family, a family member, uh, and she has this beautiful home on the hillside overlooking the city. There's this gorgeous view of Salt Lake City. Uh, I'm here for, and right now actually, I'm I'm in the basement, uh, the very well finished basement. This 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 basement it could be, it's actually nicer than uh, the apartment that Karen and I live in. Sorry for the little pops, by the way. I don't have a pop screen on this microphone next time and i gotta plan these things better <laughs> for you uh anyway i am uh i'm, I'm looking at, at this mountain view out of the basement window see it's not a dreary basement it's a beautiful basement uh and just it's remarkable <laughs> i've only been to salt lake city once before um but it was it was gorgeous then too so it's it's very nice to be here but i'm going to be attending salt lake city comic-con um and for the next for the rest of the weekend so if you're going to be there uh definitely pop in hunt me down uh you can reach out to me on facebook or, or twitter and uh if you look for at kevin tomlinson on any given uh, social media platform there you shall find me uh but reach out if you're going to be at uh, salt lake city comic-con and just say hi and we'll we'll meet up and uh i'd be happy to meet you i am uh, i'm here really on behalf of draft to digital I'm going to be actually a pin, appearing on the Writing Excuses podcast, uh, so I'm very excited about that. That that if you um, so uh, when I started listening to podcasts, when I started studying uh, writing, uh, that was one of the means that I I gravitated to was listening to those podcasts. Um, so it's kind of an honor to be on the show <laughs> again. I breathed right into the microphone. I'm trying to talk at a uh, angle so you don't get that. But anyway, I won't uh, linger too much since we're having a slight quality issue on this episode. Uh, I don't want to torture you, but I am very excited about the interview that you're about to tune into. I chatted with Russell Blake uh, a while back now, and um, you know he's an interesting cat. He and I are connected on Facebook. We share a lot of uh, sort of political leanings. <laughs> <laughs> the dude up and went to Mexico though, so I'm not sure uh, quite if I, I'm not sure I'm as extreme, uh, but I, I do sort of appreciate his viewpoint on a lot of things. And what I think is interesting, we talk about this in the interview. Um, he actually managed to land a co-authoring gig with Clive Cussler, and I do find that very interesting. Um, I've you, if you listen to the show for any length of time, you know that at one point I was trying to get into the, uh, the little partnership with uh, James Patterson. I was going, I was doing that through his master class. Uh, I was not selected, um, which I think is unfortunate for him as much as for me, honestly. <laughs> uh, but uh, that would, I, I don't know why I'm so interested in doing this. Mostly because these are guys I've read, I, I like their work, and so I, I guess I just wanted, you know 
connect with them, right? And I do that through the podcast as well. So I've got a history of wanting to connect people that I like uh, and respect. Uh, Clive Cussler, though, I my work, my books get compared to his quite often in reviews. So uh, I, I would love to chat with him sometime. Um, and I've only read a couple of his books, honestly. Uh, but I, I did enjoy it. I think I would pretty probably be more interested now in Clive's work uh, than I was in the past. But Russell has actually worked with him directly on at least two books, and uh, that's that's quite remarkable. Um, and, you know, Russell is a, uh, he's an independent author. I mean, he publishes his own stuff. So he's also a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author, which is not a combination you find very often in the indie sphere, but it's starting to become much more common, which uh, I, I don't know that we mentioned that in the interview, but it is worth mentioning here. Uh, if you are an indie author, and I know a lot of my audience is, uh, there's this growth in the industry that I think is really quite remarkable. Uh, we're, we're sort of, there, there's a sort of hybrid movement going on. And uh, unfortunately, the term hybrid, hybrid publishing has been co-opted by a sort of scammy set out there. So we'll have to come up with another name. <laughs> sort of evolved publishing. How's that? Uh, where you kind of get the ben- benefit of both worlds. You get the benefit of being an independent author, controlling your, uh, your own destiny. No gatekeepers to keep you out, you know. Uh, keeping a higher share of your royalties, that sort of thing while also um, benefiting from the networks and the, uh, the, the sort of contacts and the resources of the uh, traditional publishing world. I think that that is what's on its way. I, I really do. So, um, and I'm seeing it more and more. So I hope that you will enjoy this interview with Russell Blake. I'm going to roll us right into it. Please stick around for uh, announcements, housekeeping, that kind of thing. Uh, we've always got a little something to announce in the uh, tail end of the show. And I will see you after this interview. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is actually a first. I, I'm, I'm talking to somebody who is in Mexico. For some reason, I now that I think about it, I've never actually interviewed someone who was in Mexico. Other countries, but not Mexico. So uh, I'm actually talking to a phenomenal author uh, with a lot of credentials behind his name. I'm talking to Russell, uh, Russell Blake, and I'm sorry, Russell, I just flubbed your name right off the bat. Uh, Russell Blake, he's the author of 55 best-selling action in and uh, thriller novels. He's a New York Times and USA Today bestseller. Uh, and he's, he's co-authored two books, I believe, with Clive Cussler, Clive Cussler, who I also butchered. So you're in good company, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're two for two. I'm two for two. I, I, I'm not even going to tip my own name at this point, man. Uh, so thanks for being on the show, Russell. No, my pleasure. Uh, now... I'm- we're connected on uh, Facebook, so I follow uh, everything you're doing, everything you're writing. Uh, you and I have very similar attitudes toward certain world events, <laughs> which we won't necessarily go into. Uh, well, so that's that's why you have no friends. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, man. Uh, that, yeah, that would be it. we're in a uh, we're in a kind of a rare breed, I think, uh, in the author community. But so you are. I, I, first of all, I, let's just get the the big. 800 pound gorilla out of the room. So you have co-authored with Clive Cussler of all people. So why don't you tell me a little, I, and by the way, I keep looking for your specific books uh, with him in like Barnes and Noble. I can find them online, but I, I wanted to like sneak into Barnes and Noble and like leave, <laughs> write something nice in the cover or something on your behalf. <laughs> I but think I that's called vandalism. It is vandalism. Uh, it is vandalism. <laughs> so uh, how, did, how did that come about, though? Uh, you know, it was one of those deals where, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get. I contacted right. uh, Clive's agent, and, you know, I said, hey, I've written whatever I had written at that point, 34, 38, uh, you know, action, adventure, and thriller novels. And, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Clive's. I've been reading him, you know, ever since I was a, a, a wee lad. And, um, you know, I think that it might be a good uh, pairing. So, you know, they, they were kind enough to entertain some of my work, and they read five or six of my novels. And this went on for, you know, six months. And then... Uh, you know, one day the call came and uh, it was like, okay, Clive wants to uh, do stuff with you. Uh, fly up to uh, the U.S. and uh, 
let's hang out for three, four days and swap some ideas around. Very cool. Yeah, that's uh Yeah, it was it was very surreal. I mean it was it was just you know, it was sort of like I really didn't expect anything to happen. Right. Um because, you know, who knew? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I my favorite part of that story is is the you know, the lesson of if you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> Cause like, well, it's true. And, you know, I wasn't pushy. And frankly, he's the only one that I contacted. Oh, right, like, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I had absolutely, you know, I, you know, if I could have gotten Patterson's contact information, I probably would have right. contacted him as well. Right. But, you know, there's only a couple of guys that, that you know, I, that I write in a similar vein and pacing, et cetera, and Clive was one of them. So yeah. I thought it would be a good fit. And he seems to be very open. He Like Patterson, he's, he seems to be very open to co-authoring. Yeah, with... well, I mean, none of these none of these guys are, you know, at least that I can tell. I've never talked to Patterson, but um, he seems very, you know, he seems very nuts and bolts. And, you know, he understands that, you know, if it's a story that needs to be told, you know, and you want to put out more than X number of books, yeah. You're probably better off getting authors who have a similar voice and can right. keep maintain the quality level. Yeah. And um you know, have them help out. Yeah. Uh it's very cool. I recently I did a uh episode of, of Creative Writing Career with uh Justin Sloan. We were talking about uh vertical networking, which is kind of this idea. Like you reached out to somebody who's Who's got a little more pull and uh, has accomplished a little, just, little more? Yeah. <laughs> Man, you're a, you're <laughs> among the greats now, buddy. You're among the yeah. greats. I'm 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 counting well, you up there in the uh, Cussler area. <laughs> you need to get out more. <laughs> no, but yeah. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Clive, and he's a yeah. legend, and so is Patterson. I mean, you know, right. these guys are all household names, and for good reason. I mean, they've been churning it out for 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah, yeah. I I tried to. I did the whole. Um, co-author with Patterson thing uh, through his master class. I was trying to get into that, and he didn't select my book, so I oh. still like him. I still like him. We'll, we'll sure come you around you again. You sound a little bitter, though. Don't let the bitterness eat at you. <laughs> you know, I'm not bitter, though. I don't. I, I, I get it. That. Yeah, I'm, I'm past okay. it. I just, uh, you know, it's it's more of a, uh, oh, that's too bad, you know? <laughs> so, but you still cry yourself. I still cry. Me. Yeah, exactly. I'm, okay. I'm well, cuddling, uh, cuddling a copy, a human. worn copy of Along Came a Spider, just lamenting my <laughs> life choices. <laughs> Uh, you bastard! I hate you. <laughs> Die. <laughs> okay. So, well. so I'm curious though, because uh, one of the th- one of the hangups I had uh, with pa- Patterson's, um, if I was going to end up writing with Patterson, one of the things I stressed over a little is that he is not a pantser the way I am, but is very much a plotter. Uh, and I was I was willing. I'm there. I was willing. Uh, but I'm curious though. Is, is uh, I'm sure Clive Cussler is probably around. Uh, approximately the same way right is he very very heavy into outlining um you know he's he's got a good idea of where he wants the story to go but he's also very um flexible so i would guess that patterson is much more structured yeah um because he's famous for you know 30 40 50 page outlines right so at that point I mean, hell, the book's written. Yeah, I mean, really, I all you have to do is just fill in some dialogue. <laughs> right. It's, it's, so, so, no, there's a lot more flexibility working with Clive. And it was very enjoyable because at no point did I feel like, you know, like like I didn't have control over the story if I needed right. to have you know, So there was, there was none of that. Although, you know, I work with myself more like Pat- Patterson does. Yeah. Like my approach is very similar to Patterson, but I don't write the 40-page outline I do. You know, a spreadsheet, chapter by chapter, one sentence, two sentences, just so that I know what the point is of, right. the, of the chapter. Right. And to make sure that I've got enough reverses, reversals and action beats and, you know, turnarounds and burning questions, all of the beats. So once right. I understand that I've got enough beats and I've got enough story to actually make my word count, um, then I just write. But I've just, you know, I've done panting. I've pantsed several of my novels. Yeah. I want to say the Geronimo Breach, which some people say is still probably one of my best works. Right. Um, I pants, and the only reason that I don't pants now is because it takes me about four times longer to write the book. Really? That's, that yeah, seems because unusual. If I know where I'm going to start and finish, mm-hmm. then it's just writing. Right. 
Okay. If I have to figure it out as I go along, you know, it's kind of like, hey, you want to go from Los Angeles to, you know, Boston. Right. If, if you don't have a road map, you, you, it's probably going to take you a while longer. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. I know it's, you know, I know it's generally east. <laughs> but I've just found, you know, for me, I've just found that, that, that having an outline basically cuts my production time by a factor of four. Right. For this outline. That's interesting. So, yeah, to me, it's just like, because what it does is it forces me for, you know, three days, four days, whatever it is that I'm going to really devote to thinking through the story. It means that I've got to think through the whole story then. Right. So it forces me to do what otherwise I would procrastinate when I'm panting. I would just sort of, oh, the, the you know, the stars are going to align and the next thing's going to come to me. Well, okay. That's fine if you only want to write, you know, a couple of books a year. But mm-hmm. if you're putting out six to nine, like I've been, Right. Um, you kind of need more than, you know, divine inspiration. <laughs> right. You need right. a plan. Right. And that's what an outline is. Now, I will also say that in some, uh, you know, that's for my genre, for thrillers and for whodunits and for action adventure, it helps to know who done it. Right. But, you know, if I was writing romance or something that was, was more, you know, the POV of the protagonist and it's all about how I feel and how, you know, the plot points are somewhat secondary, is secondary to how I feel about what he just said or didn't say or might have said or might have meant. You know, that, that's a different right. kind of book, so I can see pantsing that. But, right. you, know, uh, you know, with something that's pretty intricately plotted and where I want to have a couple or three reversals at the end to, you know, twists for the reader, you know, I don't like to leave that to chance. It just takes right. too long. Yeah. I could see it. I, I, I can't, I can't do it, but I can see it. <laughs> yeah, have you ever tried? Actually, you know, um, I've tried. I have actually outlined a couple of my books, and it, it, to me, the process was much longer. But then, I'll, I think it also comes down to what are you used to? Like, what's your, what are your instincts? But um, when I was doing the Patterson thing, I, I outlined the entire book, uh, which I, I will write. I, I'm just pausing, um, but the. <laughs> because I've got, I, I I will write it because I've I've got plenty of other books I'm already writing. <laughs> sure. Okay. So. Yeah, that would drive me crazy. I only can I can only drive I can only write one at a time. Yeah. See, but that's the thing. I think that's the point, right? Every author has sort of a different approach, and, and none of these approaches is right or wrong necessarily. Just right or wrong no. for you, right? Right. And, and and frankly, it's it it also depends on what your goal is. I mean, I never thought of myself as. You know, I, I never thought I was going to be the Dan Brown of indie indie writers. You right. know, I figured that I was I viewed myself more as a Ray Bradbury, Asimov type of writer where I expected to have to put out 150 to 200 novels over the course of my writing career. Right. I wasn't going to write six books and that's it. Right. So, you know, I geared myself more to a habit of production because I figured, you know what, even if not that many people buy them on the slow periods, mm-hmm. you know, at least I'm not going to be working at Burger King. So, right. And right. so far, so good. I yeah. know, although, sounds sounds like it's know. working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't complain. I think I want to say I've done almost three million books now. So yeah. Can't so are you, uh, like, can't whine? <laughs> Can't, well, I mean, I do, but no. I, I shouldn't is what I should say. So what, what what would you say is your sort of, I mean, I assume you're writing every day. That seems a given, yeah. right? Uh, what what yeah. is sort of your process then from uh, start to finish on a book? Oh, I mean, I outline it. I typically take two to four days to outline it and make sure that I've got the story. Okay. And then once I understand what the story is, um, you know, I just sit down and I start at chapter one and I keep going until, you know, I type the end. And I typically write, you know, I used to write seven to 8,000 words a day, but now I've backed off to four to 5,000 right. because I was just like, you know, once you get 50 something books out, is the world really going to be the poor for not having your next magnum opus out, you know, in right. six weeks? Like, right. can, can they wait nine? <laughs> So I slowed it down a bit and actually, you know, been going outside and, you know, doing things like, like having a life. So yeah. <laughs> it's funny but how I mean, that you know, happens. Three, three to 5,000 words a day. To me, it's, it, it's weird though. Yeah. I will say this. When, when I was writing seven, 8,000 words a day, 
it was really hard at first, and then it got to the point where I felt guilty if I wasn't doing seven to 8,000 right. words a day. Right. Then I stopped for a while, and I got to tell you, going back to even just 3,000 a day right. was hard. That's... So to me, it's almost like a muscle. It's like going to the gym. Mm -hmm. You know, once you've been going to the gym for a while, you can lift whatever it is you can lift. But at first, everything hurts. It, it's right. Just, right. Yeah. You can find 50 different things to do besides go. It's just not pleasant. Right. So I, I'm sort of of the of the opinion that that it's much easier to turn out quality prose at a relatively consistent level if you're doing a fairly decent amount of it every day. Yeah. You, you, basically, you cap your own ability. Right. So if you're if you just make yourself get used to three to five thousand words a day every day, that'll be pretty easy for you after a couple of months. Right. No, I, I agree. I mean, that's that's the advice I, I give authors all the time. Uh, and it I mean, is think about three thousand words a day. What is that? That's three and a half, four hours of writing. OK, right. Well, all right. So right. if you can't do three and a half to four hours of writing and you're calling yourself a writer, I'm assuming if you don't have a day job, if you have a day job, maybe you can only do a thousand or two thousand. Right. But whatever. I mean, let's say you do a couple of thousand words a day. Right. Um, you're writing a novel every six weeks. Right. Right, that's exactly if right. If you're doing three to four, you're cranking one out every three to four weeks. <laughs> right, and that's a that's quite an output. I mean, I and you know, uh, people kind of stress over that, uh, and I think that they, I think that's not really the right right idea. Like, you don't have to worry that you're not cranking out those numbers. Just make sure you are putting something on the page every single day, and you'll make plenty yeah, of progress. Yeah, and I also think as a lot of it, it's about attitude. If you think it's really hard to do that. Yeah. Um, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you think it's going to be fun and you can do it in your sleep, you're right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, well, you know, so a lot of it is just, you know, your mental attitude. And they've seen that with athletes. They've seen that with just about everyone. You know, CEOs. You know, if if your attitude is, I can do this. I've got it nailed. You know, I can, I, I can, I can do this with no effort, and it'll be fun and easy. You'll probably be able to perform better because your energy will be higher. Your enthusiasm level will be better, right. and you'll be asking yourself different questions. You won't be going, "Oh shit, how do I get through this?" You'll right. be like, "You know, hey, how, how do I get to the next chapter and have it be the best thing I ever I've ever written?" That's it a is, different question. Yeah, and it is funny, by the way, that because like my first three books took me like six years to write, and then I wrote the next three in the first three months of one year, you know. And so it's, and then once you get to that point, suddenly it's it's sort of like you're excited about you're just coming up with ideas all the time <laughs> yeah. those plot no, points I mean, that you can't are always like oh I, I got this great idea for a novel and i'm like super i've only got <laughs> go about 20 it. this year right <laughs> yeah i tell them to go yeah. write those ideas people get really yeah. uh, weird about it but yeah they should go write them <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah no and, and but the, is you know what? There's no guarantees, but you know, if you want to be a writer, and God knows why anyone would. I guess it's because you're not good enough, or good looking enough, or young <laughs> enough to be a musician or an actor or something. But if you Maybe. really want to be a writer, I right. would say, you know, write. Exactly. Yeah. There's not, there are very few other ways to approach the business. <laughs> Pretty much. If I want to be a gymnast, you know, I wouldn't be bowling and, you know, right. wolfing down hoagies. I'd be like <laughs> probably, uh, you know, taking uh, taking gym classes and yeah. learning how to do you know, gymnastics. So yeah. I don't yeah. know. I don't get it because I talk to a lot of authors and many of them are like, oh, I've been struggling with this book for six months. And I'm like, I don't think I've ever struggled with anything for six months. Right. I mean, it's a book. You right. Know, just write it. Give I've yourself never... an opportunity to be bad on the first draft. Right. And g get it down on the page, and then start you know start doing triage. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Very right. straightforward. So I take it from that that you you don't experience writer's block. Nah, writer's block a block is a lack of enthusiasm. That's what it is. Yeah, I agree. And that's what it is. Yeah. It's like we're oh god, you know, it's purely <laughs> mental. Right. Yeah, I Just agree. Think about it. Writer's block. Like, oh, I can't write anymore. No, that, no, you've lost the enthusiasm for writing. Right. You don't want to write anymore because you lack the impetus to do so. And I get it. Believe me. You know, there are days where I literally have to drag myself to the keyboard where there's nothing I would rather do right. than not write. 
Right. So, you know, to me, it's just like, well, you know, it's a job. You know, yeah. I create content. That's what I do. I'm a content oh, yeah. creator, and that's what I get paid for. Yeah. So yeah. if I want to get paid, I got to go make, I got to go create some more content. Yeah. That's exactly right. Period. So, okay, like, you and, are. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure people don't, you know, ask you when, you know, do you really feel like coming to work today? <laughs> Because isn't life getting in the way? Aren't the kids, aren't you, isn't your mood? Well, I think (laughs) in fairness, people do feel that. (laughs) Well, yeah, no, I understand. You know, I've had my life, you know, my will to live sucked out of me by a cubicle too. But but again, you know, nobody really gave two shits whether or not I was particularly in the mood to come to work and do a spreadsheet. It was like, you want to get paid, you do the work. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I get it. So you, uh, uh, is so you're obsessive then about hitting your. Well, you don't. You, you've changed your minimum work count then, but you're you're coming back. You 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 don't take days off from this. Do you do it every single day? No, I I I, I do. I mean, I'll, I'll, when I'm between novels, I will. You know, I won't really write anything except Facebook. I'll probably write a couple three thousand words on Facebook a day. <laughs> right. Why people know. Yeah, they know that I'm between novels because, you know, suddenly there's these long-winded posts about, you know, everything you can imagine. Don't don't but, give um, the secret away, man. That's is this is what I do too. So <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it's not a secret. It's like you want to get good at writing, write a lot. Well, know? that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And treat everything as practice. Facebook posts, yeah, emails, of course. whatever. Yeah, exactly. Of course, and show genuine curiosity and interest in improving your craft. That's that's the other thing. Yeah. You know, and the way you do that is you read great authors. Right. Yeah. Uh, See what and, they and did. Re- and read very widely, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, read widely yeah. and deconstruct what works. I mean, that's something that took me a long time to figure out. It's really, you know, deconstructing what works in a genre teaches you an awful lot about, you know, how to be a good writer. Yeah. So, okay, you are. Famously indie. Um, I even quoted you basically, uh, not not basically, literally. I quoted you in a uh, sort of a rebuttal of all those like Huffington Post articles about how you know I would never do self publishing because it destroys literature Who or whatever. That? Yeah, I know, man. Have you ever noticed though that the the trend tends to be that they're on like Huffington Post and sites like that? <laughs> it's well, always these yeah, like I mean, frustrated yeah. traditional authors, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? Hey, I, I get it. I mean, I understand. It's like, oh, I've spent my entire life, you know, trying to attain acceptance by the high priesthood of, of literati that, you know, decide who is going to get a book published and who isn't. I right. understand the whole, you know, Stockholm syndrome, you know, thing where, you know, if I if you if I'm not being blessed by that, you know, pontiff, then I don't matter. Well, but the funny thing is that when you go to the bank and you buy a new car, the money spends exactly the same way. Right. So to me, uh, you know, I don't need an arbiter of good to tell me whether or not my stuff is worthwhile. I have, you know, thousands of readers that right. tell me it's worthwhile. So right. I'd rather have the thousands of readers. Right. Yeah. So, OK. New York, t- tell you what, New York decides tomorrow that you're not it. You know that they've they've just taken a shift in direction, and nobody's buying. You know whatever it is you write, men's fiction, whatever it is. Right. Um, you can't get arrested. So now yeah. what? Right. Exactly. You know, you look at a guy. Uh, I have tremendous admiration for a guy like James Lee Burke. You know, he spent thirteen years trying to you know after he had had I don't know how many successful books. It's like you know they just as New York decided, oh that's people that's just. It. They're not going to consume your type of product anymore, so he couldn't get a deal. Right. Yeah. Thirteen years, hundred and eleven rejections. Finally, some you know little university press in Louisiana picked him up, and he won the Pulitzer Prize. Right. So, you really want other people to have that kind of control over your career? Well, and that's that was the thing that appealed to me uh, coming in. I mean, I came off a, a traditional contract uh, before I started self publishing and. I was very attracted to the idea of, you know, no one can tell me what it is I'm going to write, you know, what I can and can't write or 
when I can publish or, you know, what the content can be. I mean, I, I, I liked that, <laughs> that level of no, control. There's tremendous freedom. Although yeah. I will say working with the guys at Penguin, um, good team, you know, with Clive's team, yeah. um, it's nice to have more eyes on the page I and yeah. know that there are, you know, some big brains that are figuring out whether you suck or not. That's, that's good. Right. But having said that, you know, you can write a brilliant book and the marketing department, you know, says that you're you're chartreuse and this year everyone wants purple and you're not going to get a, a push and you, you're going to be one of the 300,000 titles a year that the book industry puts out that just doesn't sell. So yeah. now what do you do at that point? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it, yeah I mean, you're working at a hardware store, or you're <laughs> teaching English or whatever it is you're doing. Right. And you're hating your life because what you really want to be doing is writing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I spent, you okay. know, I had, I had the day jobs for a while, you know, where I was basically sneaking off to, uh, to the lunchroom to write something, you know, on my breaks or whatever. And I, there's nothing really sure. wrong with that, but I don't, I wouldn't want my career no. to be that. <laughs> and no, I, if, I mean, Hey, listen, if you can make trad work for you, it's awesome. I'm sure. Right. I mean, it's brilliant. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm not one of those, oh, I would never take a traditional publishing deal. Oh, you me know, neither. Just, yeah. <laughs> I'm in. It's all if about I... what makes sense for, for your career. What right. do you want to do? Yeah. Now, I... having said that, I'm a terrible employee. I started I don't know how many companies because I'm just a lousy employee. Right. And I don't really respond well um, to people telling me what to do. It's probably a, a weakness of character that I've had in my entire life. But right. I just don't. I don't respond well to that, so I probably wouldn't be the ideal candidate for the, um, you know, the three thousand dollar advance paid in three payments over eighteen months. Right. And you know, you're going to rewrite it four times because we think, you know, can you put a a, a you know mixed race you know talking chimp in instead of a <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I, I just I, I'm not I'm not gonna, it's not going to work for me right so. no I know just, let's save everyone a bunch of drama you pretty much yeah. lost me right at take a year to write <laughs> yeah well there you go because <laughs> holy crap if I only put out one book a year I don't even know what I'd do with myself <laughs> well yeah there's that yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So okay, you're so you since you are primarily indie. I mean, you've got your traditional side as well. But I mean, you're how are you? Uh, how do you take care of like the marketing side of your work? That's the one thing most authors get really uh, frustrated with. So how do you I've market? I've kind of given up on marketing. Yeah, I mean, I know I shouldn't say that. I just you know <laughs> I, I I've given up on it. I don't. By the time I figure out what's working in marketing, yeah. it's not working anymore. Exactly. So, yeah. If I want to spend a lot of my time and energy trying to figure out what worked four months ago, but you know, changed fifteen minutes ago and now doesn't, um, yeah, that's a. Yeah, I could probably spend eight hours a day doing that, but right. uh, that's not. Uh, you know, that's not why I got into this. And fortunately, I have enough of a readership to where you know I don't. You know, I'm not trying to grow my readership to ten million people. If it happens, that's super, but. You know, I don't happen to believe that by running X number of ads with X frequency and rewriting the 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 header every you know forty impressions and yeah, you know, all that stuff. I don't think that's going to be what puts me over the top. Right. Yeah. So right. I don't pursue it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like a friend of mine said a long time ago to me. Said, you know. You know, most people can only do one thing really well at a time. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about, you know, chasing women. At the right. Time. Okay. You, you yeah. ever notice? You have to put down your scotch. Really, really good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the ones that are, you know, they're out every night at the bar and they're, they've always got the, the, you know, the right outfit and the hair. And, you know, it's right. like that's probably where they're spending most of their time <laughs> is on that. Right. You know? and, <laughs> That's an interesting. And they're, they're, <laughs> That's yeah, they're interesting. swinging a hammer or sawing right. something during the day. But, right. you know, that's what they're doing. So I decided a while ago I wanted to write. So that's what I do. Yeah. Uh, and, well, it's working for you. Who can argue? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, again, so far so good. Business has changed a lot. I mean, it's not like it was. 
Yeah. 2013, 2014 were dream years. I mean, they, they were incredible years. And then things changed with the algorithms and, you know, the fields all got more crowded and, mm-hmm. you know, everyone's income is down. But you know what? That's the business cycle. Nothing lasts forever. And, yeah, the only thing you can depend on is change. Right. Yeah. And I, I kind of feel like if you're being consistent with your career, you – You'll weather even those downtimes, um, at least in this business. Yeah, you're I mean, not going to get rich, but right. you'll you'll you know you won't starve. Right, right. Which is all you can really ask of anything, right? <laughs> Just no, don't let me starve. <laughs> that's right. That's, you know. No, but I mean that's that's actually how I view my career now. It's kind of like you know, there's going to be. You know, I don't know what the cycle is going to be. Maybe it's every 10 years you're going to have a couple of, like, amazing years, and then the rest of the time you're going to be sort of in this trough. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it kind of, it's pretty much not going to change my life one way or another, whether I have another, you know, two amazing years or three amazing years or not. I mean, yeah. nothing really is going to change. I'm going to eat at the same restaurants. I'll wear the same pair of shoes and, and shorts. I mean, it's not... <laughs> So, so I, I, I'm pretty pragmatic. I don't agonize over the sales aspect every every month. Yeah, that's good. I mean, uh, you know, that's a lot less stressful, and uh, you're kind of just chilling in Mexico, I guess. So, kind of, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, and you do have the whole Clive Cussler thing going for you, which is, you know, more than more than most can claim for sure. So. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, and if you want validation that you can write and blah, blah, blah. I mean, yeah, that was good for that, and it exposed me to his audience, and it was nice, and I enjoyed it. But, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to skin that cap. Yeah. I would much rather be somebody like Hugh Howie and, you know, have, have, you know, one of my first books go big and be floating around on my boat. That'd be awesome, too. Right, right. (laughs) Yeah, no, yeah. I the the custom catamaran comes up a lot on the Word Slinger podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, did... I, I spent a week with them in Cuba, yeah. like over New Year's. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. It was, uh, it was. You guys, uh, do you communicate often, or? Yeah, no. I mean, we we talk. We're friends. Okay. I mean, he's a great guy. He's got you know, we've got wild I like him well opinions. Enough. Yeah. When he first kind of came on the scene, we we were able to. I was able to chat with him. Now he's just he's so flooded with you know people wanting his attention and and you know between that and being uh, off grid essentially, you know. Dude, he's in the South Pacific <laughs> on a big boat. Right. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> Sorry, exactly. I haven't answered my email. Please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Come on. No, no, I'm not giving him <laughs> I'm grief. Bora I'm in Bora Bora learning to fire again. <laughs> I'm not giving him grief. I'm, I'm just a new tribal tattoo, so I can't <laughs> what's up with you right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm just uh, trying to keep myself in check, you know. Like, it's okay, Kev. It's okay. He might talk to you again someday. Um, so yeah, you... but I mean, how many, how many hues are there? Think about it. How many hues are there? That is certainly in indie publishing. There's yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. There's True. one guy I know that's floating around on his catamaran in the South Pacific that's tripping the light fantastic. It's right. one. Okay, there's one. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how many? So, so you know, these these are singularities. These right. are exceptions. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I do caution people: don't don't measure your career against anybody, honestly, but especially against you know Hugh Howey or Andy Weir or Russell yeah. Blake. <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> so you you've you've to done... mentioned me and uh, you know Dude. that one of these is not like the other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've done two books with Clive Cussler. Are you are you doing any more, or is that pretty much it? No, I. You know, we we decided that it was probably best to, to you know change the voice. The Fargo series is a male female. You know, it's it's kind yeah. of a you know heart heart to heart kind of um, um, franchise, mm-hmm. and they wanted to mix it up and try a female voice. Okay. So you know, I, I'm clearly not a female. So. Yeah. <laughs> It was like, okay. All right. And, and, you know, frankly, it'll be, I haven't had a chance to read the female voice um, version of the Fargo's yet, but I'm sure it's going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, but, you know, the, and, and the, these are the things, you know, we have seasons in our lives. Uh, things come in and out of our lives. And I think, 
you know, that was probably, probably very beneficial to you uh, in, in more ways than one. So, Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, look, we're, we're at time. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, so I, I appreciate you coming around. Where can people find more about you online? Uh, you can go to my blog, which is russellblake.com, um, my Amazon author page, which I'm sitting in my car, so I have no idea what it is. But <laughs> I'll if find you, it. If you type in Russell Blake on Amazon, I'm sure that it will take you somewhere, and from there you can find my author page. <laughs> and I, I'm hardly ever on Twitter anymore, so I don't even remember what my Twitter handle was. But, right. Um, mostly, you can find me you know, ranting and raving on Facebook. Or Excellent. at my blog. All right. And uh, everybody listening, you'll find links to that and other things in the show notes. So make sure that uh, you, A, stop driving, and then, B, go to uh, wordslingerpodcast.com. Check out those show notes. Uh, Russell, hang out for a minute. Uh, everyone else, thanks for tuning in. You're, you're going to hear the groovy, cool bridge music right now. You may dance in place at will. And I'll see you after the break with some uh, follow-up and a little housekeeping. Otherwise, I'll see you all next week. All right, that was my interview with Russell Blake. Um, I'm leaning in real close so that maybe this sounds just a little better. <laughs> Man, I really wish I knew what was going on. I, uh, I'm sure I'll get a thousand emails now from people who understood exactly what was happening. Uh, gain, I got all kinds of things going on here. Uh, gain and everything is is bumped way up. So, I apologize if you had to adjust the uh, volume of your uh, listening device. <laughs> at any rate, um, here we are at the end of the show. Now you're here. You're probably hearing dogs and, and that sort of thing. Uh, that's just the sort of technical proficiency and uh, production quality we bring to the Wordslinger podcast. <laughs> um, actually, uh, this is, I'm staying with my wife's cousin and she has a dog named Crosby. The dog is actually about a year younger than our dog Minnie, but is immense. Uh, but she's a she's a beautiful like chocolate lab. Um, she's um, she's a lot of fun. <laughs> I played with her last night. Uh, Abby was uh, out, and uh, I played with her for a while here at at her place. So anyway, um, and there she's barking. I think she and she sees me through the window every now and then. So she may she may sneak up on us. Uh, at any rate, a little bit of uh, wrap up here at the end of the show. The standard stuff, of course, uh, but we're we're gonna try to work in a little announcement here. But I've got um, if first of all, if you have any questions for me or my guests or uh, you want to get uh, your voice on the air, you can call me. Call me at two eight one eight zero nine word. That's two eight one eight zero nine nine six seven three. You can also visit wordslingerpodcast.com where you can leave a voicemail uh, from the little tab. It's now floating in the bottom right corner of the page. Uh, you can click that and leave a voicemail. Uh, and, uh, of course, if, it, if it's you know suitable to play on air, I will do so. Uh, so there's your chance. Now, these are generally limited to, to, limited to about a minute's worth of, of recording, so just be aware of that. Uh, some people have have been talking and been cut off abruptly, uh, which is fine, except I hate having to edit out um, the ends. You know, I, I hate having to edit out things that you were saying uh, in order for the thing to make sense, But because I want you to express yourself fully in the world. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, make sure that if you do leave me a voicemail, you leave me your name, uh, and you know, just so that I can credit you on air. Um uh, and that'd be great. You can also email me if you go to wordslingerpodcast.com. Hit the contact button. There is an email uh, form there that you can fill out. Just uh, tell me what you think and uh, you know, say hello, whatever it is that you got on your mind, and I'll be happy to I read some of those comments on air. Um, so uh, just be aware of that. And uh, it, it, I'm not going to read something if you think if, if it seems like it was meant to be personal. I, of course, won't read it. But uh, that's kind of the idea is to get people to communicate. So reach out uh you can also reach out and support the show if you go find us on itunes and uh and other uh podcasting platforms we'll say uh but especially itunes if you go on itunes and search for wordslinger podcast i would love it and it would help us a lot if you would leave a review for the show uh hit us up with uh, four or five stars uh, but in particular write something there and tell me what it is you're enjoying about the show what are you getting out of it 
uh, is it the guests? Is it, uh, you know, your lovely host? Is it, <laughs> are you an independent, independent author? Are you an entrepreneur? Um, just let me know what, what's, uh, what's got your interest peaked and why, what you're actually getting uh, in terms of value out of the words on your podcast. And I hope it's something good. I mean, I hope you are getting some value out of it. That's the whole point. So, uh, do that. You can also support the show financially. If you go to wordslingerpodcast.com, there is a button there for Patreon. And uh, I am working on the the new and improved Patreon campaign with uh, tiers and levels and that sort of thing. Uh, but if you want to go ahead and just support the show financially with a few bucks a month, that does help. I am in the middle. This is part of the announcements section, uh, segment of the show. <laughs> I've talked about this before, but I am in the middle of uh, rebuilding the website. Um bring in some uh, new materials and content. Uh, there's there's things that I want to add to uh, the sort of ongoing sort of show value. Uh, I want to start getting some transcription done, that sort of thing. All that stuff takes money, and uh, I'm happy to pay for that out of pocket I have for years uh, with some support, actually, from a few Patreon su- subscribers or supporters. But I um, now I'm kind of trying to ramp things up, so it would be very useful. What I would really like is for the show to support itself financially all around. Um, and so if you feel led to do that, I appreciate it. Uh, if you do not feel led to do that, I appreciate that as well, so <laughs> no worries. Uh, but I, I could use it. And I do use those funds exclusively for Wordslinger podcast-related uh, things. Uh, it it you know, pays for the hosting of the show. It pays for... Uh, new, you know, any new technology that I add, including um, inadequate travel microphones. <laughs> I really don't know what's happening. <laughs> anyway, we'll make it work. Uh, so, yes, you can support the show financially that way, and I do appreciate that. If um, if you have, uh, I've already covered asking me questions, so I hope you'll do that. Um, keep checking back at wordslingerpodcast.com. I finally finished... Uh, the show graphics for every single guest. So now every every time I create a new uh, interview card, it's it's in line with every other interview card. So uh, looking forward to you being able to go back and see that. So I, I did not have those when I first started the show. So the first like I don't know hundred episodes or so, not not a hundred, maybe the first fifty uh, didn't have any real graphics associated with them at all. Um, after that, I, I kind of jumped back and forth on format for a while, uh, just kind of experimenting, finding what really worked best for, you know, <laughs> Crosby, the dog. Uh, just finding what, what worked best to not only uh, look pretty, but convey some information about the guest, you know. So I've got that down, I think. So if you, um, if you keep checking back, you'll see. You'll, you can see the current ones uh, now. So check those out. But I'm relaunching that site soon. Now, here's the problem. Here's the holdup. <laughs> just just uh, so you get to see how the sausage is made, I guess. Um, for whatever reason, Squarespace, my web host, does not have a means for me to export my uh, podcasts or blog posts or anything uh, and then re-import them to another Squarespace site. So... There's, there are some workarounds. They're, they just seem like a big hassle, and I would get a not-so-great result. So what I've done is um, I've started building each and every episode again. Not the audio. The audio is still going to be the same. Uh, although part of me wishes I would just go back and you know fix a few flubs here and there. <laughs> but no. But no. No rewriting history here. Uh, but I am going to uh, rebuild each episode's um, show page with the the notes and that sort of thing. Um, I would love for show notes to be much more elaborate in the future, but uh, that's a, and I did talk to someone who was interested in possibly helping with that, and I do appreciate that. Um, But we're going to see what happens, because I I need to, I want to make sure that whatever I do is sustainable and scalable. So there are some uh, considerations at work there, but I think on the whole, we're we're on track. I wish I could give you a definite date for when the the new show website would go live um but i think it's going to be some time with me traveling over the next couple of months before i'm able to really dig in and build those show pages they're 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 time intensive i mean it took just doing the show graphics took me weeks uh 
you know, probably hundreds of hours. So, you know, I'm putting a lot of time into it. I want to make sure it's all right for you. So anyway, those are the big things. Uh, I hope you'll, I appreciate your patience as we, as we grow. Uh, but I'm really excited about where the show is going. Um, speaking of shows, I, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Where There's Smoke podcast, which featured me actually, um, briefly. They do this thing called a bump now. Uh, it's sort of a, a short little promotional thing. They have an episode uh, out right now, and I'm going to type while talking to you so I can find it because I don't remember. <laughs> it's the Where There's Smoke podcast, and you can go to where there's smoke.co. Uh, that's the, the new site. But there's an episode called Let's Dent the World, parentheses, onlyness. And it's a great interview. Um, you, not with me, but I mean, it's a, it's a great interview. You should definitely tune into that one. Um, but you can also hear me for about a minute talk about, uh, the, uh, the, the Wordslinger podcast and my writing and that sort of thing. Um, I was very glad to have the opportunity to do that. And I think, I think Brett and, uh, Nick were giving me that, that quick, uh, mention. They're going to be doing that on the show more often. So. I was the first. So there you go. Uh, but check out the show. You're going to love it. It's a sort of daily show meets um, This American Life. And the uh, the folks that, that Brett brings on are uh, phenomenal. They're the kind of guests that, you know, uh, some of them I'm going to have on my show. So it's, uh, it's a really interesting, uh, well-produced show. Check it out. Uh, and, uh, you can go, you can find that at the, where's the, where there's smoke.co and episode 77, let's dent the world onlyness. <laughs> and, uh, just listening. I don't remember at what point I popped in, but I am in there, uh, briefly. Now, one of the things that was kind of cool was, um, they actually asked, he, he, in order to sort of narrow down what I would talk about in that little segment. He's like, you know, it would be helpful if you have like a, a mission statement. I said, well, it just so happens I do. And you've heard me say this on the show before, but I'll, I'll state it officially. Uh, here's what I read on his show. This is, I've read it on this show before. It is sort of my daily mantra. It is, my mission is to craft stories that inform and inspire, educate and entertain. And that is the point and purpose of the Wordslinger podcast. This is the point and purpose of my author career Uh the work that I do for Draft to Digital, everything that I do, career and life and family, um, is all about that mission. So by supporting the show in whatever means, you know, whatever form that you choose, uh, reviews and uh, also, you know, money and that sort of thing, uh, and also in just your kind words, I mean, you're supporting that mission. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. God bless each and every one of you. Now, we're going to go ahead and roll on out, and you are hearing the music right now, uh, and possibly not hearing me, but take care of yourselves, have fun out there, and if you're at Salt Lake City Comic Con, look me up, otherwise I'll see you next time. Word slinger.